The goal of the FVM uh, is to bring programmability to the Filepoint network. This is something that's been missing for a while, uh, where users can upload uh, their, uh, their data to the Filecoin network and they can retrieve the data from the Filecoin network, uh, but it's kind of hard to customize how the network behaves internally uh, because you can't deploy um, uh, the new, uh, new smart contracts. So that's what the FEM's goal is. Uh, the FEVM, or FEVM as we call it, uh, is, is trying to bring the EVM to Filecoin so you can deploy existing EVM smart contracts to the Filecoin network. Uh, but the way I like to talk about this is actually, we're not just trying to bring the EVM, we're trying to bring the entire Ethereum ecosystem. Um, uh, so like, if we just added support for the EVM, you might have to tweak your smart contract in a little way, or you might have to like, use new tooling to write smart contracts that work with Filecoin, or your, like, uh, your smart contracts may not interoperate correctly. Um, uh, but we, we wanna make it so that you can literally just take like, your ecosystem of smart contracts uh, your like, MetaMask or your favorite uh, developer tool and just start using that with the Filecoin network without having to like uh, build everything up from scratch. Uh, so first of all, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the FVM itself, uh, just to give you some background on some of the interesting design decisions we made. Um, uh, so yeah, so the fundamentals. Um, it's a WebAssembly based VM. Uh, it's not based on the EVM, it's based on WebAssembly. We did this because it gives us near native performance. WebAssembly is very, very fast. Uh, even with uh, like gas accounting, um, uh, we were able to actually do it through very fast instrumentation so it doesn't add too much overhead. Uh, that way we can basically run applications that effectively near native performance, which is a lot better than you can with the EVM. Um, uh, this also enables uh, static analysis and audits. Uh, so if you've ever tried to like look at EVM bytecode or try to understand what an EVM contract could do or can't do, it can be a bit hard, it's not well structured. Uh, what, WebAssembly is very well structured code, uh, so you can, you can tell like what exactly can happen, what can't happen like, at, like after you've compiled it. So it, it's really a better language for building smart contracts in our opinion. Um, I, the, yeah, the, one of the goals with the FEM uh, was to support multiple execution models and VMs in user space. Uh, not just to, to be sort of like stuck with our own custom VM. Uh, so this is another reason to choose WebAssembly because it's so fast that we can literally run another VM inside of our VM uh, and the performance isn't quite native, but it's still very good. Um, uh, one of the other parts of this is that we actually need to make sure that any of the features we add to, for example, support the EVM are general purpose and can be used to support whatever VM you might want to throw in there. Uh, we'll get into this a bit later. Button. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the um, FEM is based on, uh, or is really built on top of IPLD. I don't know how much you know about, or the audience, the audience knows about IPLD or what it is, but IPLD is our uh, sort of abstraction over Merkle link data structures. Uh, so a Merkle link data structure is just a, like a, it's a hash tree data structure. It's how the Ethereum state tree, or the, sorry, Ethereum stores its state tree. Um, it's like how blockchains link themselves to, uh, to each other where you have this chain of hashes. Uh, it's how Git stores its data. Um, it's a very common data structure for um, uh, your, used in decentralized systems. Um, uh, we, we basically built this, this sort of abstraction over it called IPLD that lets us reason about these Merkle link data structures um, uh, with sort of general purpose tooling. The, the reason I bring this up is that in Ethereum, you can store your, your smart contract data in a sort of key value store uh, that just maps 256-bit keys to 256-bit values. You can build whatever data structures you want on top of this, um, but you kind of need to kind of fit your, your application into this kind of funky way of storing data. Um, with, uh, with Filecoin, you can kind of create arbitrary um, uh, state trees, or arbitrary like Merkle trees you, uh, in your state to lay out the data in the way that works for you. Uh, this also lets you like, take advantage of like, data locality and stuff like that, where like, you can like, pack data together if, it makes, if like, it's, it's uh, relevant. Uh, so like, yeah, it, just, it lets you have a little more control over how you store your data. The other part of this is that like on Ethereum, if you want to send a message to another contract, um, uh, you kind of have to copy all of this data and send it over and they can parse through it. Um, in, or with, with IPLD, you can actually just send a reference to some big data structure and then they can rifle through that data structure on their side. So it means like instead of having to call back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, I can just send you like kind of an entire subtree. You can then rifle through that, even modify it and give them back the modified version. Um, so it allows you, us to like make some really nice and interesting performance um, applications with less like back and forth and like twisting. Um, so that, that's the bit of background on how the FVM works. Uh, this is the architecture that I'm not going to go into right now. 
um, uh, but I can afterwards if you're interested. This kind of tries to cover like the whole system, but basically we have an executor on top that applies messages to a machine and then has a call manager per message. It gets a bit complicated. Um, okay, for the interesting part, the, F the F EVM. So what I talked about there was the FVM. Right now, actually, the FVM does not allow users to deploy custom smart contracts. Uh, the FVM, uh, we use it to run the built-in smart contracts right now, but we don't allow users to deploy smart contracts because we're not like 100% sure um, about like the security uh, of like how would it would interact with uh, with user deployed smart contracts. Actually, we know that like we have not completely hardened it yet against user deployed code, uh, and that's an ongoing process. Uh, so we're kind of like slowly opening it up. The first step here is the FEVM, uh, which is basically taking the EVM and running that as a built-in contract on the FVM. The second step is actually allowing everyone to deploy whatever they want. Uh, but most of this talk is about the FEVM. Okay, so this is the, the point of the talk. Uh, we are bringing the, the Ethereum ecosystem to uh, the FVM. Uh, part of this, or the first part, is bringing the, the EVM to the FVM, so running the EVM on top of the FVM. Uh, and the other part is uh, enabling Ethereum tooling on the FVM. Uh, this comes in basically two parts. One is uh, pluggable addressing and custom account types. I'll get into the details in a bit. Uh, for the first part, um, EVM inside the FVM. Uh, basically, yeah, we take the EVM, compile it to WebAssembly, uh, run that inside the FVM. Uh, one key part here is there's no special um, EVM support. Uh, we, we're, not, we're, we're trying to make sure that any features we add are generalizable so that in the future, people can add their own uh, VMs to the Filecoin network, and we, won't, like, they, we then won't just have to use like, the blessed uh, EVM or anything like that. They'll be able to deploy their own optimized or customized EVM. Uh, yeah, but this is M2.2, so we're currently targeting M2.1, where it's just the FEVM, and M2.2, we're hoping to open, or we are planning on opening this up so anyone can deploy whatever they want. Uh, yeah. Uh, the other part here is that the EVM is first class. Um, uh, we're, we're not like making this sort of little sandbox where people can run their EVM contracts. Uh, if you deploy an EVM contract to the Filecoin network, it will get its own separate actor. Um, it will be able to call the built-in contracts. Um, uh, it will use fill. It will use Filecoin gas. It's not going to use any wrapped whatever. It's going to use all the real tokens and everything. Um, uh, you'll be able to uh, also actually uh, create Ethereum accounts effectively on the Filecoin network using Ethereum tooling. Um, so this is really cool, where you can literally just use MetaMask and send your message to a Lotus node. Um, uh, we're actually enabling this by uh, uh, using by implementing the uh, Ethereum JSON RPC API uh, in Lotus, um, and then adding something called a, a account abstraction uh, to allow you to like basically allow file, the Filecoin network to process uh, Ethereum messages uh, and to actually include those in blocks and execute them. Uh, so this will really enable a lot of like cross chain tooling. Um, yeah, and, and the key part here is that like we don't want to add uh, trusted bridges or translations or anything like that. We want to just make this all work natively. Okay, uh, so one key part here is pluggable addressing. Um, this can get a little bit technical, uh, but basically what we're doing is we're adding the ability to add custom addressing schemes that are managed by actors to the Filecoin chain. Uh, so what you'll be able to do, this is M2.2, you'll be able to deploy your own. M2.1, we will be deploying a single actor that we're using this, this um, uh, pluggable addressing. But in M2.2, you'll be able to deploy a custom actor uh, that will control an entire sub namespace in the addressing scheme. Uh, so in this case, like, you'll, like, if you have an actor at ID address 1234, you will control everything under F4, 1234, dash, whatever you want. Um, this allows you to like, take an a, a, you know, addressing scheme or some other uh, runtime, some other blockchain, and just port it right in and even keep the addressing uh, format um, uh, so that everything continues to work with your tooling. Um, and also, it supports uh, Ethereum counterfactuals, so all that stuff will continue to work. It, it supports Ethereum accounts, again, with the same address formats, so all that stuff will continue to work. Uh, the second part is custom account types. Um, as I said before, uh, we're in, we've been inspired by EIP 4337 um, uh, to, to create a system where you can basically deploy a custom account that's a validate function that can validate off-chain messages. Um, uh, they don't necessarily use the standard signature formats. Uh, this, again, allows us to like, just like send a message from Ethereum tooling and it just works. Uh, okay, so that, that covers uh, the basics. Um, uh, now I guess we can talk a little bit beyond the FEVM. Um, or sorry, yeah, beyond the FEM, so this is looking forward to M2.2. Uh, yeah, so the, the past, once, so in M2.1, this is like Q1 next year, that's when we'll be launching the FEVM, uh, and that will allow users to deploy EVM smart contracts to the FEVM. Uh, in M2.2, uh, 
we are hoping to, or we will allow users to deploy like arbitrary native smart contracts. Uh, uh, so like they'll be able to deploy their own custom WASM smart contracts. Uh, the, the reason people might want to do this is you get better performance because you're not running inside a VM inside a VM. You're running directly on the, the root VM. Um, uh, and you also be able to take advantage of a lot of these native features like IPLD support. Uh, beyond that, um, I, I'm hoping to also see more optimized EVMs or alternative runtimes. Um, for example, like one of them I'm really like, interested in is something called a Gorg. It's this really cool um, JavaScript based runtime actually. I'm not a huge fan of JavaScript personally, uh, but the runtime itself is really cool uh, because it lets you like, basically lets you like, ha like have a bunch of like little, small little JavaScript objects interact with each other, but are all like due to the way they set it up, like they're all somewhat sandboxed from each other, but it's as if you have like one big object oriented programming system. Uh, so it makes it really easy to write like uh, secure and complicated smart contracts without having to think about like multiple actors because literally every single object is its own little isolated thing. It's really cool. You should look at it, check it out. Um, uh, even beyond that, like we're, we're looking into things like parallelism support. Uh, one way to do this is to have parallelism within a single actor where it can run off a bunch of parallel jobs. Another way of doing this is you can have like multiple tracks of execution, you can have some async execution. This is stuff that we haven't figured out yet, but we've been doing a lot of like uh, design work. Um, I, another interesting thing is uh, on-chain task scheduling, cron, something Quan has already brought up. Um, we really want to bring, uh, to allow users to just like schedule messages to run at arbitrary times. We actually have a couple of solutions here. Uh, one solution is you can actually, you can buy gas futures. Uh, so we could have a system where like you basically buy gas in the future, register something to be run in the future, then it gets run. You can also have like on-chain message pool kind of situations where like you submit a message, it goes into a queue, and then like one like uh, when there's sort of uh, chain bandwidth available, it gets executed. You can also have a system where like some off-chain system like submits your messages at a specific time. We generally prefer on-chain systems uh, just because they're more like you get some more guarantees there. Um, uh, but yeah, we've been doing a lot of talking about that, uh, and then finally hierarchical consensus. Um, uh, I don't know how much you've heard about hierarchical consensus, but it's another project uh, that Protocol Labs is working on um, uh, to bring basically like, uh, chain sharding. Um, it's still like this is still in its early stages of like trying to figure out exactly how to make this work. Uh, but the the FEM uh, enables this kind of thing by basically allowing you to plug in other blockchains into the, the FEM uh, using custom smart contracts. So basically, the smart contract will govern another sub blockchain, and in that blockchain, you can have another smart contract that governs another sub blockchain. So you can build this kind of like trees of chains. Uh, yeah, so that's it uh, for me in terms of uh, the technical side of things. Does anyone have questions? Do we still have time? Yeah, okay. I know I went kind of fast there. I have a question. Um, so when you're thinking about looking at the Ethereum con sub smart contracts that are already out there and porting them in, uh, I'd be interested to know like what what are the ones that, like day one, when it goes live, you're gonna copy and paste and bring in? Are you already doing that with your reference implementation? Are you just doing kind of like hello world stuff? Or are you going and like taking, uh, you know, uh, Uniswap and, and copying it in and, and testing at, with that? At the moment, most of the testing is hello world stuff. Uh, we also have an entire early builders program uh, that, where they're literally already building things on top of the Filecoin network um, and trying to, or on top of the FV, and really on top of the FVM and some of the FVVM. Uh, and trying to see what they, could, what they can do with that. Um, uh, I, I don't actually know which ones we're gonna try to port in. Um, we're, I don't know if we'll be porting, like, we're planning on leaving a lot of this up to the community. Um, I, there are always regulatory concerns around what we actually deploy ourselves. Um, uh, so as a team, I don't know if we'll be like, deploying into those ourselves. Uh, but, but yeah, basically we're trying to set it up so yes, on day one we expect a lot of people to just drop stuff. There's also, uh, we're, we're trying to build a, a build a, a sort of a builder's network, uh, ideally launching at the end of this year, uh, more in November. This is still not well known yet, so preview. Um, uh, but yeah, like there we're hoping to like basically spin up a small network where people can start playing around and building things so that when uh, the FEM, or when the FEM launches on mainnet, we'll be able to just like take everything there and just port it over. Hi, uh, very interesting talk, man, thanks. Uh, I just have a question, I, I don't know if I, if I misunderstood something, but if I use the FEVM to run an Ethereum smart contract, does it get executed in the Filecoin or in the Ethereum network? And if it gets executed in the Filecoin network, 
do I have to pay gas in both uh, the Ethereum network and the Filecoin network, or just yeah? One? So uh, it gets executed in the Filecoin network, and you pay Filecoin gas with Filecoin. Uh, so the, basically, it brings the programming and all the tooling to the Filecoin network, but it's not, it's not a bridge between Ethereum and the Filecoin network. We're not trying to like, extract value out of the Ethereum network or anything like that. We're just trying to reuse all the tooling and all the stuff people have already built uh, in the Filecoin network so people don't have to like, rebuild everything from scratch. Thank you. Um, is there any additional overhead of like, porting the EVM onto like running on top of the FV, FVM, like extra yes. gas costs and stuff? Uh, yes, yeah, th there is overhead. Um, uh, the initial implementation we had was very bad. Uh, we have now 10x that in terms of performance, and we're really hoping to 10x it again. Um, uh, yeah, like this, there's, there's a lot of room for optimization, um, and right now it's still in the early stages of like trying to do that. Um, luckily, again, uh, WebAssembly is actually very fast. Uh, adding gas accounting to it makes it a bit slower, but you can play a lot of games with instrumentation where like, you literally take WebAssembly, like instrument it with new instructions that call gas accounting functions um, uh, that like don't like, like, basically you don't actually do gas accounting per instruction. Instead, like you can look at a block of code and then at the very beginning of the block of code charge for the gas that the entire block of code might take. Uh, so it's pretty fast. 